And we're rolling. Well, welcome everyone to another digital workshop put on by Flawless Inbound. Today we're focused on a go-to-market blueprint for uh, 10 million plus B2B organizations. Uh, let's get into it. This is your first uh, Flawless Inbound workshop. Uh, some, some names I don't recognize, so really quickly I just want to recap who we are. Uh, mostly we are an organization based in uh, headquarter in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, but also with presence in Vancouver, BC. And ultimately what we do is we're a business accelerator. Um, so we help unlock your business potential through sales, marketing and services alignment. We, over the past six years, we've been extremely fortunate enough to be working with 120 plus B2B organizations in different industries. We were talking everything from manufacturing to biotech to software as a service to technology. Uh, we partner with these organizations, help them not just from the strategy level, but for also the execution level. We have a full in-house dev team and a full in-house digital marketing and lead generation team that works with them. So here's some of our sample cl clients. The reason that this is in here today is because we want to show uh, what we've actually learned from these organizations, from their playbooks, from our own playbooks that we're constantly updating and present kind of a go-to-market strategy that uh, a lot of these organizations are already implementing themselves and that we are doing for ourselves too. So uh, lastly, we partner with two global technology providers, one in HubSpot and one for Oracle NetSuite. And so Hera just wants you to know that we've, are, we've completed over 120 successful implementations of these two, uh, of these two uh, providers for all the organizations that we work with. Introducing your presenters. Uh, in case you don't know me, my name is Max. I'm here out of Edmonton, uh, working out of a home office today, um, located on the north side. A lot of people say I live all the way to Fort Mac. Those of you in Alberta know where that is. And with me today is uh, Sahara, who's our chief revenue officer. Sahara, you want to say hi? Yes. Hi, everyone. A pleasure to meet you all. I think I, think I can see more people dialing in, and I really appreciate you guys giving us the time, uh, especially during those... Uh, interesting and volatile time that we're living in right now. So I really appreciate your time uh, attending our webinar today. So I, I am your host for the day and I'll be managing the uh, presentation here. So Harris is gonna do the, uh, most of the presenting. So the relationship is very much like a Batman and Robin relationship where I'm Robin and Sahar is Batman. So without further ado, let's get going. Awesome. So our agenda today, we're right in the middle of the introduction to the webinar. Uh, Sarah's going to talk about, you know, we're, we're presenting a go-to-market strategy today, but we want to start, uh, I know it's cliche, but we want to start why uh, organizations fail and learning from mistakes. So that's where the, uh, the workshop is going to start from today. Then we'll present the go-to-market strategy that enables 10 times customer lifetime value. Uh, we're going to answer three, three go-to-market questions uh, prior to launching that need addressing. Uh, we'll get into some closing remarks and takeaways, and then we're going to get into some question and answer periods. Just a reminder, those of you who have just joined us, uh, we do have the chat enabled, so if you do have some questions, I'm going to try and monitor those as well as Sahara, and we might answer some on the fly. If not, please don't be offended. We'll answer them at the very end if we don't get to them while we're in the middle of this. We're going to try and be conscious of the one-hour time frame that we gave you. So without further ado, let's get into why do organizations fail. So Max, before yeah. you go there, I would like to just to speak to the audience just for a second. Is that Go okay? For it. Oh, and it's okay with me. You're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't we stop presenting just for a second, right? Let's sure. stop our point slide for a second. I just want to speak to everybody on the call today. So let's all agree on one thing here. And this thing is whatever is happening right now, nobody has faced before. You never learn how to run a business in a, in a global economic shutdown before. Never, right? We, we, you, know, you never... They never teach you how to do that in business school. Let's all agree on that, right? Um, and, and we have been so lucky, so blessed to be working with amazing B2B organization, especially for the last six months. And we have seen how they react to things like that. And I just want to give everybody today a reflection of what I learned personally and what the team at Flawless and Bound have, have learned working with those organizations. First, I think that we would see in the future, in the next 12 to 24 months, two type of companies 
that will emerge out of this. One type of company will be leaning towards that change. So I'm talking about, I just want you to travel to the future with me just for one minute. And let's say we're now year 2022. And what I, what I would see, just I've been doing this for some time and learning from clients in the last six months what they have been doing, there will be a type of organization that actually will lean into that change and use it and accelerate it toward their success. And I mean by that organization who understands two things. Number one, digitalization and digi digital sales and marketing organization are going to be the future. The future is here. The future is now. And they're not going back. Number two, they will rely more on inside sales uh, rep and, and more of digital marketing and e-commerce and other things like that. Then there's another type of organization that would feel that um, they want to still go back to 2019. And they will be reacting as if it's 2019. And they, was, they will be resisting change. Uh, definitely Flawless and Bound is an organization, and we're a team of 15 people full-time uh, serving clients in the U.S. and Canada. We're seeing that we're kind of we're seeing that maybe the right direction is people who are leaning and leading that change with their clients, versus people who are resisting or companies who are resisting that change. And uh, just to give you guys a perspective, I just, I just want I want a whiteboard first before we go back to slides. I want you just to think about it this way. And I hope everybody can see my, my whiteboarding. Max, is, can everybody see that? Yep. So this is kind of what I have seen from a high level perspective here. There's H. Uh, sure. Might want to get a little closer than that. Let me, let me do that. Let me do it this way if I can. Actually, I'll change the color. And I know we're doing this on the fly. And I should have done that. But let's, let's try one more time. I want everybody to just see it this way. There is C. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay. And there is H. And I'll tell you exactly what does that mean. So H is a human led organizations. They rely on outside sales rep. They rely on relationship. They rely on trade shows. And, and we're not saying that this will die. We're not saying that. We're saying somehow some of those organization will be moving this way towards and H powered by C. By the way, C stand for computer, computer. So think about Google engines, Google search engines, AI, machine learning, all those kind of things, kind of computer-based or technology-based uh, sales and marketing organization. So there's some organization that will move from purely human to human powered by machines. There are some also other organization now that were 100% kind of, kind of data-driven they now need to build empathy in their sales process. So they will move in here by saying, we have technology, but it still needs to be led by humans. So that's C to the power of H versus H to the power of C. Are you guys getting that? So then what I was trying to say here is, you would see today that me and Max were going to share with you those kind of two levels of organizations, so organizations who maybe they don't want to lean toward change. They still want to think it's 2019 and they're still living there at it. They don't want to change. They're just waiting for that. Maybe things will come back to 2019. And those are the other organizations saying, okay, how can I enable my inside sales rep? How can I do distance selling? How can I replace trade shows completely? Because maybe they will never come back, but maybe they'll come back in a different form. And how can I bring system and process in place? so that I can ensure the marketing and sales team are working perfectly. Uh, so I just wanna make sure everybody's ready for this kind of uh, conversation today. Uh, I'll be monitoring the, the Q&A. Max will be monitoring the Q&A as well, and we'll go back to slides. Max, let's, let's go back to slides. Well, let's do this. So getting into why do organizations fail? So I'll, I'll introduce the, we have five reasons here. I'll introduce one. So Harold's gonna go into uh, a little bit deeper um, on what the point, what it is. So number one is, they're unable to make a predictable, repeatable, and efficient model for retaining customers. So Sahar, you wanna go with that, what that really, the deeper meaning behind that is. So, and, and we'll, we'll give a lot of samples uh, of that, that as well, Max, right? So working with a lot of manufacturing companies or uh, wholesale distribution or biotech software technology or SaaS companies, 
we start learning from them that leaders who are looking to the future, they always want to figure out a predictable model of, first of all, communicating with their existing clients and communicating with their prospects. And I think this is kind of a statistics we captured that usually you lose influence by 10% each time you don't communicate with your prospect or with your existing customers. So now I want all the leaders today on the call to kind of reflect on the first six months, starting from March of this year, and now we're almost September, right? Six, seven months. Um, how did you communicate with the client, especially when, when COVID hit, right? Did you shrink in your communication or, or were you more open? Maybe, I know we might have uh, manufacturing on the call today or, um, uh, you know, wholesale distribution. I'm sure you guys have relationship. You're not only selling to end users or to organ other organizations, you're actually selling through distribution channels. So how was your communication with your distribution channel during those volatile times? Are you getting deeper into the relationship or not? So it's very critical to go back and have this kind of communication and nurture this communication. But now the only difference, it will be kind of distant, distance, distance, distance uh, nurturing, not face-to-face -face nurturing anymore. So those are one of the things that you need to think of. What we have seen is companies who lock down themselves and they couldn't communicate, they actually start losing market share. They didn't have predictability in relationship building. They lost predictability into adding new deals to the pipeline, even during volatile condition or pandemic condition that we're in right now. So those are one of the things that we have seen some organizations fail to do uh, during the first six months. Moving into the second reason. So they are unable to drive a under 30 day sales cycle. So Sahara, what's meant by that? So of course we understand that, especially when you're in, in the B2B space, your sales cycle is at least three, six months, maybe a year or more. But what we have seen with organizations who didn't, who, who were not having the tools, the system or the KPIs to understand what are they doing each 30 days on each deal? It was not clear to them on how they are managing the deals and moving the deals forward. They start kind of losing um, traction with their existing prospect and existing pipeline. So I'll give you a scenario. Let's say you're a software uh, as a service company or you're, let's say you're a technology company. And when you sell your services, there is a component of monthly recurring revenue, which is MRR. And maybe there's a component of project based, right? So one of the key things, especially during this volatile time, is you need to go back and secure your MRR, your monthly recurring revenue. If you lost track of that, that actually might hurt your overall top line revenue as well. So what we have seen that, again, customers who fail to focus on that, they start having some of their deal size shrink in the pipeline. Uh, others, even if their sales cycle were three, six months or a year long, as soon as they start saying, okay, what do I need to do in the next 30 days with my sales team? They were the one kind of winning the battle by ensuring that the conversation and the multi-touch point between your sales rep and your prospect, it's still live, even though there's a lot of weird condition around us, but at least it was still live. There have been discovery calls going on, maybe demo of your existing software or demo of the capability that was still going on even during this, this interesting times. Awesome. Moving on to, I should say not awesome. No, organizations fail, that's bad. <laughs> going into the next one. They are unable to drive 10 times customer lifetime value. Now Sahara, tell us a little bit more, what is 10 times customer lifetime value? So, so a couple of things here, right? So, uh, and again, uh, um, this, is, this session is mainly for B2B organizations, not really for B2C. Uh, so we noticed that organizations and sales leaders and marketing leaders who understand that there is always an opportunity for helping your customers. So we noticed the last six months, some organizations are still driven by sell, 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 sell during those six months. They maybe were perceived as a little bit aggressive. But there are other organizations who are trying to help their client by saying, hey, you had box A from me. Maybe right now we need box B. 
for box C. So they were doing a little bit of upselling and cross-selling. They were able to drive deeper, deeper contract value by increasing the, the contract or the dollar value uh, of their engagement with their existing clients. Also, we noticed that when this happened, it does increase profitability at least by 25% minimum. And the reason why this is happening, because their existing book of business, their existing customers, they can see that they're flexible. You as a, as a, as a provider of your service, they're more, you're more flexible with them. So that the, the existing book of business or the existing clients will stay with you while this is happening as well. Max, did I miss something here? Does that make sense? Well, I'd say it makes sense to me. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I, I think maybe one final point is, uh, and I think a lot of the audience probably knows that, um, especially because we have a lot of business leaders here, is it is far more expensive to recruit a new customer than it is to maintain and grow an existing customer. And that's why those are so important. It really ties into the um, the point before of how important monthly recurring revenue is to uh, especially B2B organizations. On to the next point, they're not using a wide spectrum of marketing channels that feeds directly into the sales department. So what's meant by that, Zahar? Uh, first thing, which is very obvious, that we have seen that uh, all, all, all prospects and all clients will have a functional marketing role in their organization. So maybe you have a division, a marketing division, maybe you'll have a marketing manager, or maybe you have a marketing consultant working with you or a growth organization like us working with you. What we have seen that organizations who fail to integrate this functional element and the sales team together, they lost a lot of opportunities. And as you can see here, uh, statistics, at least for the last year or six months, there was trillion dollar of, of lost opportunities costing those companies because they couldn't get sales and marketing alignment together. And I think that was a big, big, big ha moment for everyone, especially during that time. Also, what we have seen is that sometimes the sales team definition of a lead might be a little bit different than the marketing team definition of a lead. So organizations who could not redefine the marketing qualified lead versus a sales qualified lead and do a proper handoff fail to achieve the revenue targets and revenue goal during that time. Uh, you know, versus maybe a marketing team who sat with their sales team and they identified the definition of a lead. I, know, I understand we're speaking B2B here, right? So we know that at least there need to be seven to 12 touch points for a lead to even have a discovery meeting with the sales rep. So the real question is, are you doing this for your organization right now? Do you know exactly where are those seven to 12 touching points? Um, sometimes the marketing team maybe give up too early. Sometimes the sales team doesn't take those leads seriously. So as you can see, there's an alarming 79% never converted from the marketing department to the sales department. I also wanna reflect one more thing here. I want you to imagine a, a big pie, okay? And, and you have a product and a service that you wanna sell in the marketplace. Let's say in this big pie, it represents potential 10 clients for you. Here is what statistics are telling us and what we have learned six years working with B2B organizations. Out of those 10 large opportunities, five, let's say, for some reason or another, will never do business for, with you because of maybe previous relationship, maybe because they are tied with bigger contracts with other organizations. And for them to unplug from those contracts and go to you guys, maybe there's big penalties. Maybe, not sure. Now, how about the other five or the other half of the pie? I want you to visualize it this way. In this other half of the pie, maybe 5% are ready to, to do business with you tomorrow morning. And again, we're speaking about B2B sales. So tomorrow morning to me means two to three months to start engaging truly in a sales process and signing a contract. But then 45% of this other half pot, um, they, they want to know about you. They want to know about their organization, but they want to take their time to evaluate your, 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 your process, 
uh, your system, your software, your hardware, your service. They want to even ask about other clients who have worked with you before. And sometimes their research might take another six to nine months, even to a year. What we have seen is successful organization know about that. They can target them and they can eventually bring them back to a sales process versus other organization, their sales team completely deny those other 45% that can be real top line revenue increase for you guys next year. And they completely wiped it out of their CRM system, labeling them as unqualified leads. And that was a gigantic mistake that we have seen from a lot of other clients. So we're, we wanna share that with everybody today so that you guys can understand that very, be very careful how you align sales and marketing and how truly you hand off a lead from marketing to sales. And then sometimes the sales team might hand this lead back into marketing so that they can nurture it. And then hopefully next year, the sales team can follow up with. So be very careful with this one. And into the final point here, they are running a disjoined or feel good marketing plan over a results-based plan. Now, Sahara, tell us what a disjoined or feel good marketing plan is. So again, we, we learned, uh, we're not saying that we're the best, but this is what we have learned from our clients and, and other clients as well. So let me tell you the definition of a feel good marketing. The definition of a feel good marketing is you, you as a sales leader or a marketing leader, uh, or maybe the leader of the organization, you look at your own website, you say, you know what, my website looks great. Uh, I love the graphics. I love everything about it. And we always ask those leaders to say, guys, let's do a litmus, litmus test. Um, how many times did the website really speak about you, your organization? What do you guys do best? Why you're the best in the market? Versus what we call the Olympic messaging, which is kind of internal subconscious message that you have to have in the website and in, in media to say, how can I help my clients, right? So what we're saying is having a good website makes perfect sense and it needs to tell the right story, but do you really have the right story here? So feel good marketing to us would be very nice, very attractive website. There is no call to action. There is no real communication with the industry segment that you're after. There is no communication with the persona that you offer. And maybe you're spending into traditional uh, marketing like TV ads, radio ads, advertisement, maybe in, if I may say, you know, gaming and sports and all those kind of things. You don't even know if, if this is actually really bringing results for you or not. The other thing, Max, that we have seen is, you know, as, as you're sharing here in the slides, that sometimes those ads we call out of home advertisements, Sometimes what we've seen lately is that the leadership, leadership and organizations, they, they start trusting this channels less. So even the, ad, the traditional advertisement is kind of slowing down, especially stepping into uh, this kind of new era of, of running a business. Max, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I would just say too, you know, going on uh, on the point, uh, and I, I think that's this is of no surprise, this graph here, that um, one of the first things that gets cut from an organization uh, struggling in, uh, during pandemic times is, is marketing spend. Now, the interesting statistic that we, we can see is despite everyone being at home, uh, TV advertising is going down and out of home advertising has been reduced the, the least, or the most, pardon me, unsurprising here especially because for a large part you know a couple of months of the year uh people were stuck at home outside of going to you know getting some essential services like um uh, like groceries or not um digital experts from the world economic forum are saying that both digital and display are expected to go back up as well as there's probably likely going to be new niches of advertising uh and marketing uh especially lead nurturing uh, that are emerging are supposed uh, are expected to make up for the shortfall in the uh, in the rest of these traditional channels. So it's just something we want the audience here today with us to be conscious of. And I guess one more thing, Max, before we sure. go there, I think I think for the audience today, you really need to go back to the organization. Tell them, okay, guys, when you say marketing spend, what does that mean? So so here's something we learned working with a lot of organizations with the level of ten million and up you should have different buckets of marketing spend. There is the model of ads, 
That's one sub, sub line item. There is the model of content creation. There is the line item for outbound email campaigns. There's another model of CRM and sales enablement. There is a model of digital events, right? So if what we have seen is sometimes when organization just put everything in one bucket and say, yeah, marketing is bad, I'm going to stop marketing now. What we have seen is that they're kind of shooting themselves in the feet, if you know what I mean, right? Because like they paused everything. But if they can break it down into subcategories and then identify the concept of feel good marketing versus real revenue driven digital marketing campaign, then they can actually adjust and measure ROI on those channels as well. So this is something that we have seen successful organization do versus maybe other organizations who are a little bit maybe unfortunate, uh, kind of in the last one. Very well said. Um, shall we get into the meat and potatoes then of this present of this uh, of this workshop, the uh, go to market strategy? All right. So we have uh, five layers here uh, that we identified that creates really a, a strong go to market um, strategy for 2020 and heading into 2021. Uh, just of what we've observed from ourselves and also those lists, that list of clients that we showed at the very beginning of the presentation. So Sahara is going to go layer by layer with you guys. So the first being the, da the data layer. Awesome. So, and so this is, this is now like, if you guys, I know we'll get, you guys will get recording of that, but this is what we have learned, right? So when you start planning your 2021 budgets and you know, the year and all those kind of things, you need to go back to the organization and think about there's five layers for me to kind of build a proper go-to-market plan. The first one is the data layer. So what does it mean? Do we first understand what market are we after? And I mean that in, as if you're doing a, just a very basic market study, uh, study. Who's the industry that your organization is after right now? We call this uh, ICP, industry customer profile, or let's say ideal customer profile. So that's the first thing. And then inside this ideal customer profile, who are usually the target decision makers in those industries? And if you can, if I may say, maybe I'll push the team here today, but if you can identify them by list, company names, that kind of helps you. And, and I know we're going to get into that later, but that kind of helps you to understand what's the industry that you're after. And then if you have time, you need to do some, a little bit of research on who are your true competition and how are they serving that market? So what I meant to say here that um, when I say competition, I mean from your customer's point of view, why they are labeling player number B versus you as a competition. You need to understand that. Your marketing team not to understand that so that then when you start running a digital media buy campaign or a revenue driven outbound marketing campaign, or even running a webinar like this today, you need to be very um, honest to the point of what can you bring as a differentiator and help your prospect and your clients. The last thing I want to say when you're building your data layer and understanding the total addressable market is, can you go back one slide? Next oh, one. sorry. No worries. I'm still in, I'm still in data layer, right? Is try yeah. to it's okay to be brave enough to go into something called the micro vertical market. So let me give you a scenario. Uh, we've been working with a lot of manufacturing companies lately. And while we're working with them, we're learning that now, let's say they're essential manufacturing. And they said, you know what? We do a lot of box A and we ship it out to distribution. But here is exactly the kind of distribution we want. Maybe they are in the food industry and they, they're doing kind of more of, you know, uh, polishing and uh, coloring of, of food machines and all those kind of things. So that's their, we call this the micro vertical target market for them. So they're not just marketing and selling to everybody in the food industry. They have a micro vertical market that they decided to go on. Now on the sales activity sides, you need to also have a data layer. How many calls do you need to make? How many emails you need to make? How many meetings you need to make? And Hopefully in that data layer for the sales team, your sales leader are empowered enough to take this data layer and then use it as an input so that when they're coaching their sales rep 
in the future, they can coach them better. Gone are the days of a sales forecast when you're saying, guys, we need to hit our number, just go and work. Gone are those days. Sales leader right now, their mission is to transform from managers into sales coach. But the problem is, how can you coach if you don't know how truly your sales rep is performing? You also need to be very careful with, are you coaching uh, depending on lagging indicators or leading indicators? So lagging indicators is, oops, I didn't make my number this month. That's kind of lagging, lagging indicator. Leading indicator is, how many phone calls did I make? What, what was I very um, you know, consistent in the message? How did I came around objection handling? How many times in the call were, were I listening to my prospect versus I was just presenting feature functions? That's called leading indicators. So as a sales leader, you need to make sure there is a tool that can give you this data so that then you can coach your sales team to do better. So that's kind of point number two in the first layer, which is the data layer. Then going to point number three, and this is more about marketing analysis. Now, are your marketing team actively directing and impacting the sales team? And this is back to, if you remember, one of some of the reasons why maybe organization failed, there was no uh, marketing and sales alignments. Are truly the marketing team giving you right dashboards or is it more about how many visits and how many people looked at our YouTube channel or how many people are following us? I can promise you right now for B2B organization, those are absolutely useless KPIs. For B2B organization, I would like to see a different KPIs. I would like to see how many people are attending our monthly webinars. How many people are actually engaging with our sales rep in meaningful sales conversations? How many people are downloading a specific case study about a micro vertical that we work with in our, as an organization? To me, this is very critical KPIs that the marketing team needs to bring to the sales team as a data layer that they can collaborate on to move and enhance and optimize. On to the next layer, which is the technology layer. So, which is now, since now we have the data layers, hopefully, hopefully uh, we're not asking you guys to do that manually yourself, right? Definitely you need automation, you need scaling to be able to do this uh, properly. So when you think about the data layer, um, hopefully when you say sales only CRM or something more adaptable, what really we mean by that is we, hopefully you're investing in a CRM that is not isolated just to enable the sales team. It's part of a bigger uh, platform that have maybe a sales component, a marketing component, a customer services component. And then hopefully this technology layer can actually do a lot of, a little bit of automation. You can't automate really everything. So lead qualification. Do you have lead scoring engine? Uh, is it a manual lead scoring or is it an automated lead scoring? Do you know how many touch points your prospects are actually kind of consuming when they are in a sales process with you? Does your sales rep on daily basis with a mobile device, can they know who is looking at your website right now and who of those they're already engaging with in their sales pipeline? Do you have a tool that can actually tell the marketing team immediately not to market to uh, leads who are so close into signing a contract with your sales rep because that can completely blow up and confuse the prospect. So all of those can never happen without a technology layer that can truly bridge sales and marketing process correctly. And here's one more thing, and we've seen this with a lot of B2B organizations. We get it that there's a lot of change process that needs to happen, but the main thing is, do you have a predefined sales playbook this is not like we need to do this today and then tomorrow we're going to change the model. Do you have a predefined sales pre-book that you know that your inside sales team are following and you can measure how many of them are following and not following? This is very critical. Then I'm sure some of you guys here today heard about the concept of account-based marketing. This is actually a proof point. If you have account-based marketing running in your organization, 
it's a proof point that your sales and marketing team are on the same page. What's account-based marketing for maybe some of the team members who never heard of this term before? Think about it that the marketing team now and the sales team sat together, identified that in year 2021, those are the 70 or 80 customers that we must win. So now what the marketing team are doing, they're backward engineering to say, to win this, what kind of sales enablement tool can I have online and offline with my sales rep so that they can use it to help engage with the decision maker? And of course, we're hoping that the technology tool that you would pick will have a little bit of an AI enablement model so that you can monitor the, the prospects and kind of understand, are they really engaging with us? Or are we just annoying them with our marketing campaigns and maybe they're not even a prospect for us? Going into the next layer, which is the people and strategy layer. So one of the things uh, we start seeing is that now this is layer number three. So think about it. We start first, we said, you guys need to have a data layer. You need to understand what you want from that. And then we said, we need a technology layer to hopefully automate what's in the data layer and then bubble it up so that your leadership team can take proper decision. But then at the end of the day, uh, I'm hoping that your team can now really um, absorb this data and use it properly so that then they can start really consume this data. And it comes into two, two things, people and strategy. So is your sales team really spending time to understand their prospect? And do they have easier access to the CRM to be able to do their job day in, day out? Uh, is the sales process programmed properly in the CRM? Do you have a digital sales playbook that your sales lab can check box and follow? And is the CRM monitoring the sales playbook on daily basis, on weekly basis, in different regions in your operation? I'll give you a scenario. We've been working with a company in the US they are 200 sales rep spread nationally in the US. And when we start working with them, they're amazing salespeople. They're almost making their numbers, but their VP of sales decided that we need a consolidated sales process in place. So the only way for us to achieve that, we used a tool like HubSpot. In their CRM, you can program the sales playbook digitally, and you can know exactly which sales rep is following and asking the questions. You can actually report, you can run a weekly report on how many questions were used by how many sales rep in what region. And then you can map it into uh, how many days did it take a sales rep to close larger deals. And then you can compare it to sales rep who used the playbook and sales rep who did not use the playbook. That's a great feedback to you as a business leader or a VP of sales, because now there's an opportunity for you to go back and coach your sales team. And maybe it's an opportunity for you to adjust and optimize your sales play playbook if maybe it's not working anymore, uh, because maybe there's different conditions and your sales message and sales process need to change. But the key point is your team needs to tap into this data and hopefully your strategy can be adjusted for this data as well. Moving to, oh, pardon me, actually, we have a follow-up to this slide. So we have nine B2B sales frameworks. And Sahara, just quickly, probably not go through all nine, but just give a high-level sure. overview so, on uh, what the... So, so to, give you, to give you guys a perspective, sorry, Max, I don't mean to cut you off, just yeah, yeah. talk about that. So each and every time we work as an organization, like we're, again, you guys know now about Follow and Bond, we're a growth organization. We help into working with the marketing team and sales team. Usually in the past, we usually work with the marketing team to kind of build their process, build the system, use the HubSpot tool to do all the, all the kind of things that I mentioned before. What we find is maybe sometimes the sales team maybe are kind of doing the right thing, but they're doing kind of the traditional sales, the face-to-face -face sales, the referral, networking, trade shows, all this kind of good stuff that we know now, now and in the future, uh, you know, life is changing. We're, we're stepping into a new era. So the first thing we ask the sales team is, do you have, a sales framework. What's the difference between a sales framework and a sales process? A sales process, think about it as um, a version of one of the sales framework optimized towards your organization. And it matched the culture of your sales team. 
And it matched truly the passion that your sales team is carrying when they're telling a story about your sales, sales pro, uh, your product and your services. So without going into more details, because that might take me at least two hours to explain each and every one, there are nine, almost 10 sales, pro, sales frameworks predefined. There is lots to be honest with you, but what we're sharing with you today here, I think Max, there are two slides, am I right? Uh, no, no, this is just the one. Yeah. So there's actually nine or 10 different sales fra uh, framework. Usually when we work with an organization, we interview some of the key sales reps or the rock star sales rep. We understand how they're making their numbers. Then we map it back to one of those sales framework. And then we kind of now build it as a sales playbook. Then we go back to your CRM and we program it and literally code it down in the CRM. So that then you won't only have two out of 10 people do it, making their number. Hopefully then that will enable the rest of the 10 sales rep nationally in Canada or the US to follow the same sales playbook that the, your rock stars are following and making their number. So that's kind of a quick summary of why we're bringing uh, this into the conversation today. Moving along to the next uh, go-to-market strategy layer, the total addressable market layer. So of course, when you start speaking, like remember we, sp we spoke in, uh, in layer number one, we said the data layer is critical for us. It's very important that when the marketing team and the sales team sit together and say, this is our kind of attack target plan, we call this the total addressable market, right? So let's say you wanna expand somewhere in California, and let's say you are selling a software as a service uh, platform to do, I don't know, um, yeah, make a coffee online, something like that. So you need to understand who is the total addressable market? Who can actually buy this product and service for me? As soon as you get that from the leadership team, we use tools uh, like Zoom Info. That's a tool we use all the time with ourselves and with our clients, where we can actually start curating and building lists of companies, not only companies, we can know exactly what's the revenue level, this public, public information. How many sales rep, how many marketing team, who's the decision maker, what do they do, how can we help them? And then we curate, we extract this list, then we can load it in a CRM tool like HubSpot, then we can start running account-based marketing on them. So, but to start, you need to have a list. You need to understand what's the total addressable market that your sales and marketing team are going up to. And then, you need to understand what kind of the unit price that your marketing team need to market for and would the prospect be open to that pricing model for you or not. And there is a lot of tools that can help you as an organization to adjust your pricing depending on the condition uh, that you're selling to or the market segment that you're selling to. Now, I also know that today and or people who are watching the recording in the future, you might be selling products, you might be selling a service, you might be selling a subscription model. You might be selling co collectively the three or the four. There is actually ways for you to adjust and optimize your, uh, your pricing towards the, the market segment that you're after as well. Excellent. And the final layer was just the messaging and content layer. Uh, and, and Max, just wanna make sure that there is, if there's questions, make sure I can see some stuff. Yeah, yeah, it looks like, make sure. looks like okay. I'll monitor this one. No yeah. problem. So I'll cover layer five, which is messaging and content. Uh, but just, just be, before, before, before I go there, I just wanna make sure everybody understand that uh, when we speak about um, all the other four layers, we wanna make sure that somehow the marketing team are building the proper content strategy uh, for all the previous four layers. That, that's kind of very important. So for example, when we, if we're working with a client, uh, we usually build something called content clusters. So those are topics and subtopics that we know that your persona will be very interested in. It can be in a form of content like blogs, eBooks, videos, webinars. Uh, it can be live demos. It can be pre-recorded demo if you're a software as a service company. Uh, uh, sometimes with companies who are SaaS based, like software as a service organizations, we built something called a, a product qualified lead pipeline for them versus a manufacturing organization who wants to acquire or build a relationship with new distribution. So we build a membership section on their website. 
So then if I'm going to use this team for this manufacturing clients, I want to log in. I need to have my own uh, you know, profile on their website so that each and every time they're coming with a new product or service, or maybe I have an RFP that I want to engage them in, I can log into that member website and I can engage with their sales team. So you need to be a little bit creative uh, to see how can you build the content and the messaging and make sure it's kind of mapped around the other four layers uh, that we discussed today. Sahara, so John has an excellent question here. Uh, it's very topical. What sales framework is better suited uh, to the current conditions? Does my tech stack decide what framework I use? Thank you. Great question. Uh, so first of all, absolutely not. You should not have a tech stack decide on the sales fr framework. Uh, the sales framework needs to come from within the organization. It must, must match the sales culture of your team. Max, can I ask you a question? Can you go back to the uh, mm -hmm. sales framework just for a second? Yeah, of course. Let me just backtrack here. Oops. Here so this is what we learned. Medic is one of the advanced sales process. And usually we've seen this with organization where their um, uh, ticket item is somewhere around $200,000 to a million dollar in contracts. Usually Medic is the one that we would suggest. But still, we need to meet with their VP sales and sales rep to understand how they do things. If you are, let's say your, your, your ticket item is from 15K to 100K, what we have seen is sometimes it can be maybe the inbound sales. Uh, sometimes we use the basic one, which we call it bands. It looks like snap selling, but bands stand for budget, authority, need, and time. And then as a flawless inbound team, we actually added C beside it, which is is the organization you're selling to are willing to change, are willing to adopt your products and service or not. To be very honest with you, we have never seen that people are changing the sales framework because of the condition. That never happens. But what they can do, they can change the sales message and the frequency of touch points depending on the condition. But the sales framework or the sales process, usually it's kind of programmed in the system. Now you can revisit the sales framework or the sales strategy um, each couple of years to adjust and optimize, but to kind of move it completely out of, uh, out to a different model. I, I didn't see that a lot. Assuming of course, that you're starting with a good sales framework that match your culture base. Awesome. Awesome. So now we get to, we've decided, we've, discuss the five layers that are essential for a go-to-market strategy now. Now there's three real big questions that need answers before executing it. So, so are you ready to get into question one? Yes, let's go for it. All right. So are the five layers integrated together? So of course you guys would expect, sure. we need to make sure that the five layers are integrated together. But going to the next slide, I think Max is where you will take us. There we go. To be able to do that, to be able to say, okay, I'm, I'm planning for 2021 now, I'm in Q4, like how can I, how can I do that? Let's say you're going back to the organization and say, guys, I'm going to use a new technology or a MarTech stack, or I need to adjust my sales process or things like that. Change management, it's going to be the maker or the breaker of, of, of having your sales team or marketing team follow a process. So you need to ask yourself, is what I'm bringing to the organization will increase productivity? Is it going to, when the user adoption is there, are they going to use it for a couple of months and then go back to their old habits? Or is it a sustainable user adoption? Uh, by the way, are the leaders of the organization embracing and supporting that change or not? And then of course, with, with everything, hopefully uh, you have a partner uh, that can help you in implementation and consulting on the right process for you. So that's kind of in our model to be able to integrate the five layers, change management is critical. Next. You would, next. See, yeah. when you would see that when we, when we build this model, you need to make sure that there is buy-in from all the layers of your organization. The team that's going to use this process or use this technology and also the leadership team. So the way how we would advise that if you're coming with a new process to your organization, first, you need to make sure everybody's aware of why are we doing the change? What's the why? Let's say, why are we moving to a new CRM system? 
why, why we decided to change our financial model to a cloud-based ERP like NetSuite. Um, what are we designing as an outcome of that change? And then be ready that people will maybe sometimes object. So you need to understand from where they're coming and then empower them with, with more reasons in their divisions while you're doing the change. Last but not least, have them engage in the process of change. So now you start having more ownership to ensure that the change is sustainable, hopefully for years to come. When you apply it this way, then we know that there's a sustainable adoption to any change that you can bring to your organization. And John just asked another question. I think he means on this side, explain what's in it for them. What's, what are the advantages of sustainable adoption? Absolutely, absolutely. That's mm -hmm. very critical because they need, they need to buy in, Max, right? So that, that's a great point from John. Mm -hmm. Point number two, are you solving for the same? Sales team. So what's meant by that? So we're, we're, we're discussing change and we want to we wanna do a lot of things. The key question that, let's say I'm speaking to the sales team, the sales department right now. Are you, are you taxing the sales team to do more things or are you taking things off their plate that you can automate and then help, helping them to do what they do best, which is building relationship with your prospect, telling the story, adding value, being, being empathetic in each and every step in the process. So I'm sure some of you guys heard about the model of that flywheel, which we always say, put the customer in the center, have marketing, sales, and your services team all connecting and kind of connecting and handing off to each other. So as a sales leader, or as a growth leader in the organization, you need to ensure that you are empowering, you're adding velocity to your sales team by focusing on, are you giving them the right list? Uh, are, they, are you enabling them with more sales enablement tool like recorded webinar today, this webinar will be recorded. So I know that my sales team are going to use it in the future when they want to open new relationship with larger organizations. That's a sales tool, okay? Uh, do they have pre-made personalized target emails? Uh, do you have um, um, a micro industry page on your website that actually speaks the pain point of this micro industry? Those are like you're adding velocity so you're adding force so that the sales team can do more. But then on the other side, which is as a sales leader, you need to remove friction. So let's start with coaching. But listen, you cannot do coaching without data. So do you have a tool or a platform that can curate data so that you can coach better? That's kind of now when you coach better, eventually your sales team can be more productive, which now you're removing friction between your sales rep and all the misses that they might have on a sales call. Can you focus, can you help them focus their energy on the right deals, with the right accounts and the, the right organization? So hopefully when you do that by adding force when right, removing friction in certain layers, when you do that now, this means that we are kind of enabling and kind of running, running in the right direction, Max. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And on to the final question that needs answering. Are you automating and creating for your organization wherever possible? Now that's a biggie. What is meant by that? Okay, so you know when, when you start looking at automation and, and process enablement and all those kind of things, there is a lot of tools out there, right? So we're not saying one tool is better than the other, right? But the key thing that you need to make sure of that this tool is not just to micromanage your marketing team or your sales team. Uh, you're actually building this to make sure that your sales team hopefully can make their number this year and future years to come. And then at the same time, your marketing team actually can collaborate better with your sales team. So in your reporting, make sure you're designing the report in a way that looks to attribution of sales and marketing effectiveness. What does that mean in just basic English? How many leads have been successfully moved from your marketing division and your sales division and your sales team was able to close on? Number two, a basic reporting we always do in sales, something called the sales water flow. Uh, how many deals have been added to the pipeline? How many deals have been removed from the pipeline? Do you have a report like that in your CRM or not? Uh, number three, um, how many days have it takes your sales rep to close deals? And what's the value in dollars? And um, how can you enable and accelerate and reduce the sales cycle? Also, as you can see, 
I can actually start running report on unit price of revenue. So back to maybe you're a SaaS based organization, maybe you have three pricing models, which pricing model, which subscription service is selling more and why? You need to know that. Back to manufacturing, which distribution is selling more deals for you? Uh, let's say you have four or five or six different product lines, which product line now should you should lead with in which industry? That's called the unit of revenue. And can you be more efficient in doing that? While you're doing all of that, your mission is to make sure that you're solving for your team and you're moving bottlenecks in the business, regarding of, reg regardless of what are you doing in the middle. Make sure you're not just trying to build the perfect process that it looks amazing, but it's so complex that nobody's using. And make sure, again, that your sales team is coached to actually follow uh, follow this process properly, and hopefully the marketing and sales team are aligned to do that. Great. And now we presented a lot today, so we want to refocus the audience's uh, focus, uh, refocus the focus, great <laughs> sentence there, Max, on uh, a couple of key takeaways here. So I'll show those. And Sahar, do you mind pre presenting them? Sure. So I know we covered a lot of things today, right? We covered the reason why organization maybe are struggling and then we, we go into the five layers and then the three go, go to market strategy. And you guys, hopefully you're enjoying the recording or the live session. But those are five, like four takeaways. First, we understand that everybody now is heading into Q4 of 2020, uh, which means you are in the budgeting phase. So my real question to all the leaders on the call today is how confident are you with the go to market strategy? If you are not, if you're 60% confident, I'm okay with 60%. I'm not okay with 20% or 40%. So if you feel that I'm not sure yet, I'm kind of shooting in the dark, I'm not sure what's happening with the economy and things like that, my advice to you, go back and revisit our go-to-market approach that we shared with you today. And also confirm if you really have those five layers that we shared with you, are they truly in the organization or you need to start budgeting to build those layers together? Okay, that's number one. Number two, um, as we said before, whatever process you choose, whatever software tool you choose or, or direction you choose, just make sure of the reason why you're choosing it. So if we're always optimizing for a customer centric organization, that's, this is kind of really why we're even in business, right? So make sure that the key three things to service your customer is the sales department is hopefully working more efficient and less friction. The marketing team are more efficient. They understand metrics and they can hand off to the sales team properly. But please, 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 don't forget that the third division is so critical for you. The, 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 the delivery team, the team that actually is going to give the product or design the product, write the software code, or consult with your client, the services team. And we need to make sure that if somebody's calling them because there's a problem, somebody's actually following up with them immediately. Remember, Keeping your book of business and growing it, it's much more easier than adding new to the book of business. So the services department is so critical. Uh, so think about NPS scores, uh, building a knowledge center for your existing customers that they can know more how to troubleshoot themselves a problem in your product or in your service and so on. So those are things you need just to think of as a takeaway as well. The third thing is, um, what element of tech stack that you want to get to enable your sales and marketing team? Speaking about CRM, marketing automation, customer services queue. Uh, as you guys know, we, we, we have been working with the HubSpot tool. We have implemented the HubSpot, HubSpot platform for almost 120 plus B2B organization in the US and Canada. So the team is very confident that this platform can achieve and enable the three departments. But again, having said that, maybe you guys have a different platform. It doesn't matter. It's a technology tool. But make sure you choose a platform that is easier for your team to use because adoption is critical. But then at the same time, it gives you the right reporting and it enables the data layer for the leadership team to take a decision so that they can coach and take future direction better. Excellent. Now, moving on. So Heron, why on earth do we have a picture of a race car as our next slide? Clearly, Max, you, you love car racing. Uh, so, uh, I, so that's, I think- that's I do, that's, that's actually me, if you can't tell, driving. Yeah, it's my, it's my, it's my side hustle as being a race car driver. I think, I think the message here is we understand that all sales leader and market, actually all business leaders right now are under a big pressure. 
And their mission is to make sure that the car they're driving, the race car they're driving, which is the business, needs to be very efficient. Each function of it needs to be very efficient. And each time, hopefully each year, hopefully you're putting your race car in, in a faster track. So the concept of Formula One, right? How can you make sure that all the divisions or the components of, of your engine are efficiently working properly? And we hopefully are putting you on the fast track. So how we usually do that at Flawless, the way how we do it is we have three, three Ps, right? We have a playbook and we have uh, people who can help you with that. And we have a technology platform that can help you with that. There is no surprise why we are leading with two technology vendors now worldwide. HubSpot when it comes to sales and marketing and Oracle NetSuite when it comes to financial dashboards and KPI system for all the organization and an inventory management and a warehouse management, all those kind of things. Because we want to make sure that your dashboard, while you're driving this fast car, you can see all your KPIs and your metric at the same time. The good news is HubSpot and Oracle NetSuite have native integration. Our team are trained to do that. That's on the technology side. But then on the playbook side, because we have been doing this for six plus years, we are learning a lot. I can tell you each six months, we're adjusting and optimizing our playbooks, depending exactly on the market segment and what industry and clients we're serving. And then last but not least, of course, our team, uh, we have been uh, you know, fortunate enough to have an amazing team at Flawless and Bound. And by the way, I just want you guys to know, <laughs> everybody's working from home, uh, of course, because of the current condition we're in. Uh, but uh, we actually have an amazing team and this team is kind of growing and they're being certified and working with a lot of complex organization right now. So we start building a deep skill set in specific industries. So definitely we're here, we're here to help and, and chat with you guys uh, when the time is right. Yeah, as you guys can see, Sahar misses the office environments so much that he's renovated his entire home to look like the flawless and bound office. It's some, <laughs> uh, some real dedication to that. So uh, we run right along, just going back to the people. So what's meant by that? Um, all, every single organization that works with falls and bound gets a team of experts uh, as the race car kind of metaphor goes that Sahara was saying, it's not a one person operation. We want expertise in every single level of execution. So whether that's an account manager leading from a strategic level and being a main point of contact to a website and graphic design developer who is always on the fly making sure that your website um, and that your graphics and any of the content that's put out there is look, uh, is, uh, is up to your standards and that your definition of success is also our definition of success. Um, so that is the, the team of six now, uh, keeps growing, that supports every single customer. So we're just at the very end. Uh, we want to encourage everyone to please follow our LinkedIn page. Uh, this is where we post not just our content and what we're up to, but uh, about things like webinars, events, uh, what we're up to uh, that we're doing here at Flawless and Bound. That is your best source of, um, of content. So please go to uh, the Flawless and Bound LinkedIn page, give us a follow, we'd really appreciate it. And also you can connect with the two of us on here and also with John, who's very active on LinkedIn and is uh, in the audience right now about us uh just a couple of quick points so we've mentioned it before we represent two large brands uh technology global brands in hubspot and oracle netsuite uh hubspot on the sales marketing and service side and for all uh and erp needs we uh we use the number one uh cloud erp platform in netsuite um we actually have a book uh if you're interested in getting a copy get in touch with one of us so the marketing manager journey to the summit uh, one, one of our, uh, one of our presenters that is actually a character in that book. Okay. Okay. I wonder, wonder who it is. Um, part of a number of, um, organizations. We're really lucky to be part, uh, member of Vistage, BC Tech and the Mars Discovery Dis District. And we are fortunate to be one of 14 HubSpot, uh, partners in the entire world. And we're talking 2,500 partners, uh, to hold the HubSpot Advanced Implementation Certification. That is something our team worked toward really hard uh, towards getting that accolade. So something that we are extremely proud of. 
And that brings us to the very end. As I said, uh, we'd leave a opportunity for questions. Uh, so now if there's any in the chat, um, uh, or if you just want to uh, make a comment, we uh, will wait on here for a little bit longer to answer those. Thanks for everyone for being here today. Yeah, I just want to say thank you everybody for uh, joining and uh, looking forward to uh, future discussions with you as well. Thanks, Max. Great job. Thank you.